Back on the floor of San Diego Comic Con 2015. My name is Eric Nagel. It is the It's Eric Nagel Show. And uh, it's been pretty cool to be on here on the floor here. We're at the NECA Toy Pavilion, smack dab in the center of everything going on here on the floor of the San Diego Convention Center. Thousands of people. It's hot as hell. Some areas really smell because people, I guess, just have BO problems or not really showering. But hey, that's what a convention is, and that's con life. So if you come down to these things, uh, that's what you get to expect. Especially if you're wearing a really elaborate costume that doesn't ventilate very well. A lot of people in vinyl, a lot of people in spandex, a lot of people in leather. It cannot be pleasant for these people, and I don't know why they put themselves through this hell, but they do for your entertainment so that you'll stop them and take photos and for one brief shining moment they feel like a celebrity. I guess that's what Comic Con's all about. To come down here to dress up and pretend to be somebody that you're not to feel better about yourself and your life. Moving on next to the movie Vintage Tomorrows we're gonna speak to director Bird McDonald. Uh, Bird did this movie it's about the steampunk culture that's on the rise in the United States and all over the world as well. Steampunk, uh, he'll explain a little bit more in depth as to what that involves. But to give you a quick example, the end of Back to the Future 3, when Doc Brown returns with the train and they're all dressed in uh, like 1800s clothing, but the train can transform, it can fly, it can time travel. That's steampunk style stuff. So he did a whole documentary on this big uprising in uh, counterculture and now invading Comic-Con and, and all walks of life. So we're going to talk to Bird McDonald right now. Vintage Tomorrows. What the hell is steampunk? We'll find out right now. It's Eric Nagel at San Diego Comic-Con. We might have to stop down once you come take our order. What do you want? Oh, we could we could do it on there. I just okay. want a nice tea. We just come around. What an Arnold Palmer. That's exactly That's what, what I, I want. want too. See, I knew I liked you, Bird, yeah. and this interview is going to be already, off to a great start. Insane. I'm talking with director Bird McDonald, and one of the fun things about San Diego Comic Con is that you can do interviews anywhere. It's not just in a studio. It's not just at a booth. And this poor lady just had money go flying all over the place. Go pick up some hundreds there. <laughs> um, you know, you're poolside. You're in a hotel room. You're out by the about by the bay, like we are. We're at this restaurant right here, and we're here to talk about your movie, Vintage Tomorrows. Nice to have me on the show. That's yes. probably. The, let me try that again. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show, sir. No, no problem. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Vintage Tomorrows. Vintage Tomorrows is a documentary about steampunk. Are you familiar with steampunk? I'm very familiar with steampunk, and I do have a lot of steampunk questions for oh, you. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, do our audience need a uh, working definition of what steampunk um, is? It's a mixed bag, so maybe we should explain. <laughs> so steampunk, uh, you know, if you ask 10 steampunks to define it, you're going to get 10 different answers. But my, my go-to is steampunk is a literary and aesthetic movement, fascinated with Victorian England, fascinated with technology, uh, looking to create stories and create uh, objects that are inspired by Victoriana, and to make, create stories and write stories and tell stories based in that time period with anachronistic technology that probably could not have existed at that time. Right. So for those who, um, who need a, a more of a visual other than watching Vintage Tomorrows, um, say if you watched Firefly or, or uh, um, oh, Back to the Future 3, when he comes back with the train, how they're all dressed up, but the train has futuristic uh, technology to time travel and fly and all that stuff, Very good. that falls into the steampunk genre yeah. there. Wild Wild West is another example that I think is a quick read for people. Yeah. Who are you going to call? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the steampunk movement also has gotten so big that there's actual conventions now for this yeah. thing. Uh, my co-host Matt, who couldn't be here, uh, is really big into steampunk. In fact, he just went to a big steampunk convention that was uh, down near Philly in New Jersey there. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are dressing the part. People are uh, selling their wares. Mm -hmm. Stuff crafted out of iron and steel. Mm -hmm. But then maybe has a... Um, like an iPad thing built into it, yep. you know, or a television, those kind of things. So it's a meeting of old technology with futuristic technology. That's, uh, that's, you're doing a better job defining that than I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> what is the obsession? Like, where did this come from? You know, it's, uh, all indications seem, seem to lead back to it being, you know, starting as a literary subgenre. 
it starts with uh, books that were being written in the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, you can go way far back to, you know, uh, Jules Verne and anything that he wrote. If he wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea today, that would be, you know, the new quintessential steampunk book. Um, but back then, they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, they weren't playing with the, the past because they were living in the past. Right. So, uh, the book that really is credited as being the, the first uh, true steampunk book is a film, book called The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling. And that's 1992. The word is actually coined in 1987 in an issue of Locus magazine. So it had this moment that it kind of starts in the late 80s, early 90s. And then it just sort of dipped away again. It became like, you know, a little bit of a relic or, you know, a footnote. Uh, it, 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 cer- to, it, it certainly in, in wasn't the, cyberpunk at that point. Right. Well, cyberpunk was Billy Idol at that point. Yeah, but exactly. uh, in the 90s, the, the, the rare times that you saw steampunk were um, the Time Traveler movie, mm-hmm. you would say, I, or that might have been 2000, around that time period. But you would see it in science fiction shows as just a not even a B story, maybe a C story and a background setting. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they'd walk into this area. It's very steampunk. All the technology stuff's going here. Let's find the villain, fix the problem, and get back to, you know, what we perceive as normal time. Yeah, I agree. It was sort of like, you know, an embellishment more right. than it was like, a, you know, any sort of ism. And then in the aughts, in the 2000s, we began to see like this sort of ripple that begins in like 2005. And by 2007, there is, you can track it, there's so much steampunk cultural activity happening at that point. Right. Um, and so... For the last decade, and I and I credit, you know, steampunks are really into technology. That's a little bit of a misconception by some people that they might be ludites or people that don't like technology. Yeah, they're they love not it. Amish. They're not Amish. Uh, they love it. Uh, they dance. They're more Mennonite. They're more <laughs> Mennonite. And so, you know, I think like a lot of the best of fandom, you know, the internet helped these people find one another. You right. know, and and it just sort of t- took off from there. And I think you start seeing the first cons around 2009, 2010, and now we have so many of them. And um, it's also, you know, migrated uh, until they had their own cons. It was migrating into, like, San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con where people were dressing the part. People had mm-hmm. uh, weird technology on display uh, at their booth, even though they weren't selling that. They were selling stickers and shirts or whatever. But right. then, you know, there's a steam iron toaster right, right there where gears and uh, mechanism. That's the whole thing, too. With, with the technology, it's keep... You know, bring some of the futuristic tones to it, but show the gears and the inner workings and show that it's not really running on electricity. You're, it's running on something that's generating the electricity. Absolutely. Steampunks want to get under the hood of right. their technology. And I think as I went into this, you know, I'm not I'm not a steampunk. I'm way outside of this, the subculture, but I love subcultures. And I love, uh, I made a documentary earlier on in my life about people who build haunted houses for Halloween because on it, I needed to understand what that was about. Why do you want to scare people? What's, right. What drives you? With the steampunk film, I really wanted to understand, of all of the sandboxes that you can play in, and if you're a science fiction person, science fiction is so much about looking into the future, and you can predict anything, why are you drawn to looking backwards? You know, you are still creating new things for that time period that didn't exist, but I wanted to understand what, what drew people to that. And by the end of making the film, that technology question kept coming up as as, as for me one of the most provocative questions like we live in a time when everybody has a cell phone everybody has a smartphone everybody has the all of these screens that we look at and all of these objects that are kind of pretty in an Apple design kind of way but they're also meant to keep you outside of getting inside of them you cannot modify these technologies you're actually meant to throw them away they're meant to be disposable right. and that seems to be a little bit of the steampunk ethos is that you know maybe technology should be more human and it should be more there should be more snags and there should be more capability to actually modify it and if it broke god forbid i mean if you drop your iphone in a bathtub it's over but right maybe we should be able to repair these things because if we look back to the last great technological moment which is the turn of the century uh you know back then if you graduated from high school you understood basically how to fix any technology that we had at that time you mastered the art of smelting exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> and that. soldering and uh uh, even in a way, because they were building cogs and, and, and shaping iron and steel, um, 
you know, it's almost like a blacksmith as well. Yeah, I mean, I think a, another big thing that comes out in the film, of all of the ways steampunk can be expressed, you know, there's a lot of beautiful examples in every genre of expression, but I found myself really uh, drawn to the makers and the people that are making those objects. There's a group in my film, uh, Obtanian Works, who are out of San Francisco. They built a three-story Victorian house that drives around, and they take it to Burning Man. Burning Man's another... Uh, subculture scene where, where you see a lot of steampunk activity. It's where the hippies went. It's where the hippies went. And now, you know, there, there are some people in the film that were actually answering the question, you know, steampunk is today's, you know, answer to the hippies in the 60s and the beats in the 50s, that it's a, an actual legitimate subculture, counterculture, if you will. Oh, it, it is, because, I mean, Burning Man is bigger than ever. And that hippie culture, I think, is credited more, because a lot of times when you, you, you use the stereotypical uh, hippie terminology, people are thinking the 60s, they're thinking Woodstock, or they're thinking the ones that are following the Grateful Dead, maybe Dave Matthews and Fish, those kind of things. But the modern version of it, with the Burning Man scene, it, it's hippie, but it's also mixing into like the uh, the EDM scene. Mm -hmm. So you've got these hippie chicks who aren't shaving and, sh and taking showers, they're still making plates of spaghetti and, and you know, <laughs> and uh, building little crafts to sell, but then they're tripping out to like Skrillex, yep. you know, a, a dubstep and then, well, dubstep's even, that's gone now, but, uh, but a lot, you're you know, right, current like, stuff. A lot of the, the same. Steve Aoki, those kind of things. The same desire to like, hang out together and form little you know communities form a culture form a culture form a community and take care of one another and I think if it was legal they'd be more compounds again I, I, I don't, maybe there are steampunk compounds that we didn't found or that we didn't find but they're buried inside the mountains in Cheyenne Wyoming and I think at the end of the day like you know as, as, a, as a species we seem to want to belong to groups you know we seem to want to find people who are like ourselves and hang out with them and, and that feels like family and that feels like home and I just think the steampunks, you know, are really driven to get their hands dirty and make stuff. And that that seems to be a differentiation for me from, from some other fan cultures where maybe it's mostly about consuming what you love as opposed to actually getting in there and making some of your own stuff. You know, steampunks dress up, but they're not dressing up like other th things that they've already seen. They're creating their own personas. And I think that's, that's pretty cool to me. Steampunk just defined as being... Um, like I'll say 1800s in, in America but the Victorian era and stuff like that is it um, is it just defined to that particular time period I don't I think maybe the time period but not just England I think you see some you know Wild West you know some American yeah, well, that's what I'm saying 1800s United yeah. States or the Victorian England yeah those two but yeah. is it limited to that I mean if you go back further like, would the Flintstones be considered ste steampunk? Because they're, you know, the, they're in the caveman Would that uh, be like paleo era, But they had cars and television and those kind of things. I don't think this, that Flintstones had steam engines, though. So I think right. we'd have to find a new But even steampunk... For them. Look, this is why I keep getting the vision of Doc Brown with the train showing up at the end of Back to the Future 3. Because it was steam or coal engine steam. Um, the train had uh, futuristic properties. It could time travel. It could transform. It could do all those things. But as it, I've seen the genre expand, not everything is just, it runs on steam. A lot of it is gear generated. Right. So right. does this, even though it's lame, try this again, even though it's named for the steam uh, usage, it's, I think it's kind of outgrown that too. Well, I mean, there are, you know, splinter groups like diesel punk is factions some, you, yeah other factions <laughs> diesel punk is one you know when I, the new mad max film the whole time i'm watching it i'm like this is steampunk to me oh but except it's, it's gas right you know uh not not steam so but i think as far as getting we'll just say this getting the mat even though we know there's different versions of it for the mass me uh, medium out there that either knows of it or doesn't know it at all no matter how it's broken down, it still kind of just goes under the label of steampunk. I think so. It's a, it's a catch-all, if you right. will, for anything that's playing with older technology and trying to, you know, imagine what you can do with that. And by older technology, we're not talking about playing, with, you know, with the old Wurlitzer organ that your grandfather had or something like Or your, like that. your old Commodore 64, although yes. I'm sure somebody is modding a Commodore 64 in steampunk as we speak. Look at my dot matrix printer, green and red. I'm so <laughs> steampunk. Um, one thing you said too, uh, around 2005, you, it started a, um, um, a resurgence, an explosion, yeah. if you will, of this thing. What around 2005? What caused that? Other than the internet, was there something uh, specific? Was it an event, uh, a you gathering, know, a movie, something that that that's 
sparked people's interest and said, this could be something viable? I don't know that it was a work of any one work of art or any published anything. I think it was more, again, that moment where the internet was exploding and people were just be able, able to make that connection. I asked that question to almost everybody in the film, and if they had an answer, that was the thing that... That's almost like trying to fi- figure out the Big Bang, like yeah, what started it, it, it. It's like, where did this culture come from? Well, it's around this time. Well, what was this specific thing? You know what? We really don't know, but it started around this area and then just grew. There were some, you know, some books that began to bring it back into the focus. Sherry Priest's Bone Shaker was a book that came out around that time, and it was a best-selling book. And uh, she's in our film, and she uh, even she doesn't understand why it, it caught the zeitgeist or why it sort of captured people's imagination at that particular point. A lot of people in the film uh, talk, you know, again they talk about that moment where everybody had a cell phone so you could find one another right but also that same moment where like everybody was just beginning to have maybe discomfort about all of this technology this modern stuff that we had and that you know yesterday you know the wall street or two days ago wall street shut down because of a glitch united airlines has been grounded because of glitches let me tell you my flight on wednesday i'm taking off to come to san diego we get off and then you got to wait till you hit about 10,000 feet for the Wi-Fi in the plane. Not very Steve Punk, but Wi-Fi in the plane. Um, modern marvel of technology uh, kicks in. And then when I did, I you know I searched Twitter and, and some news feeds and stuff, and all of a sudden I'm seeing United, United uh, coming across all the news feeds. I'm like, what the hell happened? We're in the air. And then I see they grounded everything. So you know you start freaking out, but you don't want other people on the plane freaking out. And then until you hear some other guy go, what the fuck happened with United? Yep. And then right after that was the New York Stock Exchange. And then right after that, DC lost power for like two hours. So what happens when the grid goes down? I mean, that's actually what, you know, if you can argue that there's a political underpinning to this right because uh, there are many many steampunks that, that take this really far and, and they they practice what they preach they, they really want it to be about like you know recycling objects anything that you would make in steampunk should be something that has already come before and you're just you know hacking it and re- retooling it to be a steampunk object these people you know they argue that steampunk actually could be a life-saving point of view because as we become so dependent that we don't understand technology we when we can't we can't even touch it because it might break uh, you know what would happen if the grid goes down well yeah, we have to go of, back to of, some of the older technology a lot of technology i mean look at everything you have um all your videos and photos and music on your phone are there but they technically don't exist it's not something that you hold you can pick up and, and you can't and touch make, it. and make work it's right it's not tangible a lot of our stuff can't touch anymore it's it exists but it's like it doesn't it, it's a weird thing to try to wrap your mind around yeah. it exists but it doesn't exist there's no f- uh, physical um uh, property to it so if it does go down you're fucked yeah. but in the steampunk era and that kind of thing you built it so if it goes down and breaks you can take it apart you can work with the gears you, it was pretty much life before m- the the modern digital exactly. age it's like, it's like macgyver set in 1876 you know and it's I think steampunks actually want this stuff to break because they that's the fun part. I mean, the, within the community, you know, a large percentage of steampunks, you know, maybe there's a small percentage that really just like to dress up and they like that aesthetic. But right. largely, these are pretty smart, geeky, engineering type people who really do want to understand the way things work and break things in order to, you know to take them apart and put them back together because that's the way their brains are, are wired. Right. That seems to be what unites a lot of them. Yeah. Um, we only have a few more minutes here with you. Vintage Tomorrows is the movie. Yep. Uh, where can people get it? Uh, well, our premiere is Saturday night at Comic-Con. Uh, Manchester Grand Hyatt Ballroom D, whatever. I don't know when this is coming out, but there this you go. Is airing, this is actually airing that night. <laughs> uh, so we're having our premiere as we speak. Uh, we have a website where we're going to provide information about the release. We're still in discussions with distributors, but I anticipate that it's something you can download and uh, and watch this year. A video on demand kind yeah, of thing. All right. Exactly. Well, where would they go for that? Um, well, I think right now go to our website, www.vintagetomorrows.com and await future word on where they can watch it. Well, we'll look forward to this. I Thank definitely you. want to uh, see. I saw the uh, the teaser that yeah. your your guy sent over there. Yeah. I would like to see the rest of it. I'm sure a lot of people listening. Uh, we just were, got our first review. It was kind of exciting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, who. Uh, a lot of people who uh, who were into the genre or maybe hearing this for the first time and go, you know, I've always seen that. I don't really know about it. And this might be my uh, 
step into exploring and everything, definitely check out Vintage Tomorrow's. Uh, check out the website, like you said, for the information of where it comes out. Um, is there anything from the movie we that people should know about that we haven't covered here as far as Steam? I think you've pretty much... Who, who pre- did you talk to? Pretty much covered it. We've talked to, you know, a lot of the writers credited with galvanizing the, the literary subgenre because that is the beginning. And we, we spoke to William Gibson. We spoke to Sherry Priest. We spoke to Gail Carriger. Um, numerous other people, graphic novelists, Paul and Anana, who wrote Boilerplate, which is a great, beautiful example. It's sort of the gateway drug, I think, for, for steampunk. If you don't know what it is, check out Boilerplate. <laughs> and if you like it, then there's a lot more for you. Um, and we spoke to a lot of people in the maker scene. Uh, and and uh, my favorite thing in this whole film is the Never Was Hall, that three-story house on, on wheels. And Shannon O'Hare out of San Francisco made that with, with his team. And they're like, they're truly... Uh, a wonderful group of people. They they walk this. They they live it. They breathe it. They form a community around it. They go to Burning Man with it, and they they just want to make stuff, and they want to inspire people to to learn to do things that they didn't think they could, and that right. that's a pretty cool thing. Well, thanks to the digital modern age, you can go online to us. Uh, find out all this information about <laughs> Vintage Tomorrows and get a tangible copy that doesn't exist, but it's there for you to view at one point. Um, we'll, we'll take Brad, <laughs> Brad, we'll take Bird McDonald at his word, even though he's not wearing suspenders or a bowler hat, so um, I don't know how steampunk uh, his credibility is, <laughs> but the uh, the movie seems amazing, and uh, if you really want to get a crack into this subculture, and it, and just so people know, because a lot of people just brand all this shit kind of nerdy and, and uh, you know, dude bros and jock type people, which is like, I don't want to know. It's actually kind of smart because it's engineering and it's science and it's not just like, oh my God, uh, you know, I love Deadpool. You know, it's not a comic book kind of thing like that. It's actual tangible stuff that existed and was part of human culture that they're trying to just keep within the culture and not go completely digital where we're not touching anything. I think that's accurate. That's a good... I might... Can I, can I borrow some of that? You can my quote spiel? me on that, please. <laughs> Just put me... Uh, put my Twitter handle on it if you can or something like that. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on Bert the show. McDonald, it was a thank pleasure. you so much. Vintage yeah. Tomorrows. Go check it out. All right. Thank you, sir. It's Eric Nagel at San Diego Comic Con. We're back on the floor of the 2015 San Diego Comic Con. My name is Eric Nagel, and uh, we're broadcasting from the top of the NECA Toy Pavilion, right in the center of the San Diego Convention Center. You got a good view of seeing everything that's going on around here. We're going to move on now. We're going to head over actually to Petco Park, which is where the San Diego Padres play, and it's also the home to the Nerdist Industries for San Diego Comic Con. They took over the whole stadium. They have stages, they have a carnival, they have all kinds of cool stuff going on, and they partnered to put out a movie called The Hive. It's a suspense, thriller, horror movie, brand new. Um, We're going to talk to the director and the cast right now. So let's go over to Petco Park, Nerdist Industries, Nerdist Carnival, and talk to the cast and crew of The Hive. It's Eric Nagel at San Diego Comic Con. I'm here with the cast of The Hive, a brand new uh, horror movie coming out, thriller movie, suspense. It's got everything here. Can you you guys tell me a little bit about it? It has a lot of things, I will say that. Um, Yes. Gabe, why don't you tell (laughs) him about it? (laughs) You've been doing a pretty good job. Journey. Yeah, right, right, right. right, 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 right. <laughs> this is Dave, the director. Yeah, here. he's going to tell us about the hive. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, as the writer director, I, I always want people to know as little as possible because I want them to have the the the, the true hive experience. Is is you know, it starts with Adam waking up in a room, and he's covered in this stuff, and it's all over the the room, and, and then end credits. End that's credits. That's it. it. That's the whole movie. <laughs> 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 I mean, so much of the experience of the movie is going through what he's going through with him and putting the pieces together, the mystery, why he's locked in there, who left him the notes, why every piece of the, you know, in the first five minutes, we set up like 20 different mysteries of like, why is, why, why are there scissors on the floor? Why is this here? Why is that here? And we, you know, and, and I think. The, you know, we aim to answer all of those piece by piece. It's interesting that you, you spend that much time to to set it up because nowadays everything's got to be quite okay. Here's what's happening, and everything else has yeah, to follow go, right after go, that. Because right, yeah. a lot of kids, and I'm not saying you guys, but a lot of kids, you know, have, don't have the attention span where they're like, "Why do they keep asking so many questions? Just answer everything immediately. Give it to me." Um, so uh, it has this set up here, and uh, so after the 20 minutes, you see all these pieces here. So he's going through this whole oh, so thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say 20 minutes, I, yeah, but there's a, a couple minutes where you walk around and you, and you, you see, he, you know, he learns stuff. And, and um, 
Yeah, and then and then piece by piece he starts putting things together. What's really going on? What's happening? And things keep getting revealed, and you start to learn about every every aspect of it. You know. And uh, uh, yeah, drop yeah. that over there. And uh, can I call you Gabe? Can I yeah, call yeah, Gabe? Yeah. Uh, I don't know you that formally, so I didn't want to uh, yeah. step on any toes. But um, for those who don't know who you are, uh, you're Adam in the movie, but you're also um, Adam. <laughs> um, you, they may know you from the Big C, yeah. um, which was a which was a great show, and uh, I think ended a little too early than it, than it was supposed to. Should I have mean, been I the know, writer, man. I know Where the story. Were you at? <laughs> <laughs> I was watching, but I, I don't know who to talk to. You know, um, so going into you know, going from a, a major television show into uh, this kind of genre, the the horror genre here. Um, what is the transition like as far as going from something that big into something where you're pretty much, uh, I don't know if it's uncharted territory for you, going into the indie scene and going into horror movies like this? Well, uh, uh, Super 8 was sort of like horror -y. We had a creature there that we chased. Not necessarily that there's one like bad creature in this movie, but the sort of running from something and being afraid was sort of familiar but the way that Dave put it all together was completely foreign <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that I think that genre like just to the genre it's completely foreign so it would sound weird if I said you know I did this before because there's really nothing like this that I've seen um, but yeah uh, it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun to do it with someone who's like as creative as and stylistic as Dave and act with these guys and Talk to his <laughs> Steve sometimes. <laughs> Get a little dose of Steve and then forget that he was ever around. <laughs> uh, to her. Um, hello, Hi. how are you, Gabriel? Uh, and you uh, play who in the movie? Well, who's your character? My character is Jess, and I also played uh, partially the voice of the virus. Now, this isn't your first venture into this kind of thing as, uh, either because you did uh, one of the paranormal activities. Yeah, paranormal activities. Is, is, is this a genre that you're falling in love with that you want to do more yeah, with? Yeah, you know, I always loved horror films. You know, like my mom uh, like brought me up on horror films. I loved like all the Halloween movies. So it just happened to be that like right after paranormal activity, I fell into the hive. And, right. You know, like supernatural seems to be like following me. It's not a bad. Uh, it's not a bad gig. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question for Dave. Um, since we, I'm all over the place because we only have so much time here with you. Uh, but going into um, the, the supernatural and horror genre seems to be really. Uh, coming alive lately a lot of these um, lower budget and more independent style uh, movies are doing better than when they put out the big Hollywood uh, slasher films or even the uh, uh, the ones that are like uh, possessions or exorcisms and things like that these smaller indie films seem to be more believable just because there's not a big studio and there's not um, you know a major uh, Hollywood name attached to these projects there yeah how does uh, did that worry you going into this thing to be, to be completely honest with you, I, I, when I got involved in this, it, it, there was so little thought about business, and it was so much about championing a vision that I had for this film and just trying to like see it realized, and, and honestly using whatever I had to do to, to get it realized, right. and to make what you're gonna see, you know? And so, and so it, it was very little consideration to me. You know, I had an opportunity to make it, and I was so incredibly excited about it, and I just picked up and went. Well, you're coming out at the right time, because I think even 10 years ago, trying to do a movie like this in, in such a small scale, just it wouldn't flow, because it would kind of get out in maybe a handful of theaters, and there wasn't the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of a Netflix or on-demand service, stuff like that, to, give, to boost it on the other end. Oh, yeah. But now to put it out here, and the younger generations love going to these movies and watching these movies uh, on demand and, and what have you because it's not the big presentation from the studios like going to see an Avengers things like that they want to have their thing this feels like it, it relates to their generation sure and, and look I'm in a pretty unique place because you know for the last 10 years I've been I've been making music videos and you know music video budgets aren't what they used to be I'm, I'm like you know I've been yeah, trial by fire with you know low budget filmmaking and I know it I know it like the back of my hand and so when we came to do this project I felt very comfortable working in that space and I really think you know people are going to feel I don't think people are going to get mired in the idea that it's you know uh, uh, that it's low budget I mean I think they're just going to see it and it feels like a movie I'm not saying the quality is low budget sure, I'm saying sure. as far as uh, as how um, 
critics will review it or how the press will perceive it is it's like well it's not sony behind it it's not universal so it's a low budget kind of indie kind of thing and they'll just say yeah it's got its charm whatever and then they kind of write it off but it's really the people that um go and find this online or see the trailer stuff that go out and say and it's word of mouth saying this movie is amazing you got to go out and, and, and check it out yeah yeah i mean that's the hope i mean those are the people i made it for how was the financing for this? Like, how, how hard was that to pull everything together? You know, I was really, really, really fortunate that I, that I was around some amazing producers and they really uh, did a good job of shielding me from it. So I got to be creative and I got to work with these guys and that was it. I mean... <laughs> did you pick all of them or is this just all... They, like, you're, they're attached to the picture. I, 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 I mean, this is 100% true. I had no pressure on who I had to pick. I picked these guys because they are the people that I wanted in my movie. They gave me the best performances in the auditions and they and and they they killed it. They killed it. I mean, I remember you know our, our audition. We went we went extra long and we were just working through it and we just had chemistry and and she I mean killed it. And I mean with all these guys. Yeah, no, no, I, it was uh, as far as the financing, that was never in my mind when telling the story. It was just trying to tell the most unique story we could. And it was always big for me to to, to want to tell the story. You know, it's sitting in the trailer waiting for a setup. Like, it, it's just trying to make this as, as scary and real as possible for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's so different, I feel like. It's so different, I feel like, you know, like you're saying, like, oh, Sony's not behind it. I feel like people will forget about that watching it and just be in love with the story because it just, it, it, it draws you in and forces you to connect with it. And I mean, I haven't even seen it yet, but I just, <laughs> like, I, I have seen, like, bits and pieces of it, and I just feel like through the script and through what we did, like, it, it'll draw you in and you'll just want to know more and more. Yeah, you lived it. I lived, lived it. it. Well, you haven't seen it, so how disappointed would you be if you go to see it and you're cut out of the whole movie? You're just in the trailer. <laughs> you know, I can um, promise you that didn't happen. I might cry. Um, yeah. That would never happen. <laughs> well, I'm running out of time here with you. Uh, I'm speaking to the cast and the director from The Hive. Uh, when does it come out? Trailer drop today. Trailer, the trailer's out today. <laughs> uh, we're still waiting on a release date on Sorry, this. But check I'm, out the trailer. Yeah. Uh, where can they go for more information? What's the website, the social media, all that stuff? Um, I, think, I think you would go to Nerdist, uh, and Nerdist will be keeping you up to date. And I, honestly, I feel so lucky to be in, with Nerdist. I mean, they're such a great company. You they know? are. They're Thank you guys thanks. so much for this, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Whoops, you know what the music means. Our time is out. Yes, our time is up from the floor of the San Diego Convention Center. 2015 San Diego Comic-Con is coming to a close, at least for this show. My name is Eric Nagel. So many people to thank because so much has gone on, and uh, we've got to make sure that we get everything in here. First off, we've got to thank uh, Greg Opie Hughes and Don Wicklin for making this happen and allowing us to, uh, to come out here and do everything. We do really appreciate it. We want to thank our friends at Loot Crate who sponsor the show. Go to lootcrate.com slash OP and save three bucks on a brand new subscription. I want to thank Roland. Now, I know Roland gets a lot of shit, but Roland really made a lot of things happen out here at Comic-Con. Uh, there's interviews that we have that we still haven't had time to air. We're going to do that probably next week. Roland really went above and beyond trying to get everything done that he possibly could for interviews and arrangements and all kinds of stuff here at San Diego Comic-Con. So I want to give him props. Rolandos99 on Twitter and Instagram. Follow him. I want to thank the guys at NECA Toys for allowing me to use their space to broadcast portions of this show that you have heard today. NECAonline.com. Thank you, Randy, as we spoke to him earlier about all the new products. Thanks to everybody that we spoke with today, especially thanks to Dwight Howard. I mean, that was just a chance meeting running into him on the floor, and he took the time to hang out and talk a little bit about the con and the experiences, what's going on with him. So cool. Thank you so much. Uh, the cast of Doctor Who, Ron Perlman, Bird McDonald, guys at the Nerdist, by the way, have been very cool. Uh, we couldn't get Chris on the program this time, but maybe next time around. Matt Myra, you know I've been texting you. I want to get you on the program to talk about your new podcast. The clock is striking 7 p.m. here on Pacific Coast time. And by clock, I'm looking at a replica of the, uh, the clock tower from Back to the Future right in my eyesight here. So that means we have to go. Please follow It's Eric Nagel on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and you can also follow E-Rock Radio on Twitter and Instagram as well if you feel inclined to do so. This show will be up on Sirius XM On Demand. Uh, the interviews will be up on YouTube at some point. Till next time, be seeing ya. And that's all the time we have. 
Go fuck yourself, San Diego. Follow the show at It's Eric Nagel on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. The show should be back next week on OP Radio. Nice work, everyone. Sharp broadcast. Really good. Everyone on the floor as well. Really a lot of hustle. I liked it. Serious XM.